Our passage this morning is Proverbs chapter 5. You and I get to be a fly on the wall and eavesdrop in on a conversation between a dad and his sons. The father's given his boys good, proper sex education. Growing up, my parents never said anything to me about sex, never handed me a book on the topic to read, nor even a pamphlet to look over. But I did have 15 seconds of sex education. And when did those 15 seconds come? When I was standing over here in the wings of a church in North Carolina with the best man of my wedding, my stepfather, and I was about to walk out here to take a wife. So my 15 seconds of sex education went like this. <clears throat> my stepfather said, son, may I ask you a question? Yes, sir, dad, what is it? Have you and Susan decided on some method of birth control? Yes, sir, we have. Okay, okay, I just thought I'd ask. I just thought I was asked. And that was it. Were those 15 seconds sufficient, adequate sex education? Of course not. Now, as a professor at Moody Bible Institute, I would often ask my classes, I want you to raise your hand if your parents gave you good, sufficient sex education. Now, usually I had 45 students in each of my classes, and at most five students would raise their hand saying, yes, I had good sex education from dad and mom. That leaves 40 who had none. Yet, it is mainly the parent's responsibility to instruct their children about sex. Don't depend on the church. Don't depend on the school to do it. Though I had no proper sex education, I still learned about sex. And who are my teachers? The television, Movies, radio, the world, the locker room, the military, the devil, the gutters. As a result, I had an awful lot to unlearn about sex. Now, some years ago, after my classes at Moody were over on a Friday afternoon, I was driving home and I had in the car one of our lady students, a young woman in my class. It took us an hour to get home through all the traffic. And about halfway home, uh, this young woman was going to spend the weekend with us because she wanted some time with my wife. And about halfway uh, home, she asked this question, Dr. Sauer, may we talk about sex? And I thought, I didn't say this to her, but I thought, I am really pleased that this young lady is comfortable enough to ask me about this subject. And I asked her, why did she want to talk about sex? And she said, because I have no sexual experience and I'm engaged, soon to be married, and I cannot talk to my dad or my mother about this issue. Now, should you be uneasy about the topic of the sermon this morning, remember that the Bible speaks often and openly about sex. And why does God talk so much about this issue? Because it holds the potential for great blessings. Now, let's turn that coin on the other side. It holds the same potential for great sorrows. Now, for many senior citizens, sex is in their rearview mirror. So isn't this too late and unnecessary for them? Now, a few years ago, I had to go out of state to hold a wedding. <laughs> Not a wedding, a funeral. And uh, after the funeral was over, I was approached by an elder in the church, and he said, we have a problem. There is a 78-year-old man in this church, married, who is in an adulterous affair with a 30-year-old married woman in this church who happens to be our pastor's wife. He was seven. Now, usually, young women are not attracted to old men. So this was unusual. But the man in the affair was 78. I'm 77. If that happened to him, can that happen to me? Yes, of course it can. So now, this is where Scripture says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. So all of us senior citizens will throughout life be 
vulnerable to sexual immorality. As long as we're here and breathe, we are not immune to this sin. And of course, young people are especially vulnerable. They tend to be strong on passion, short on prudence, lacking in self-discipline, and sometimes foggy in their thinking. Now, I want to read you just a bit of a letter that I received some years ago from one of my former students at Moody, and he starts the letter off like, I might not remember him. Oh, I remember this fellow real well. And one reason I did is because um, the way he was converted. He's from Massachusetts, and Boston is Gordon Theological Seminary, wonderful Christian school, and he was a non-Christian. He needed a job. And so he went to the campus to apply for a job, and the administration building is set on the second floor with stairs, concrete stairs leading up to the door when you go into the administration building. He didn't walk up the stairs. He rode his motorcycle up the stairs and into the lobby and got off his motorcycle and asked them for a job. To my surprise, they gave him one. So now... <laughs> Working on campus around people he wasn't accustomed to, Christians, he was very impressed by their love for each other. Their high standard of morality, he eventually became a Christian. And boy, when he came to Moody, he was passionate for Christ. So the reason I remember him so well is the unusual way he was saved, riding a motorcycle up into a building, and then his passion for Jesus as I taught him. Well, he graduated from Moody and went back to that school in Boston now as a graduate student to prepare for the ministry. And he writes and he says this, I'm a graduate of Moody and I have a problem I think you can help me with. I'm skipping a lot of it. I became a Christian at 18 and was not raised in a Christian family. My life before conversion was marked with the usual adolescent debauchery. I had sex with my girlfriends throughout high school. Once I became a Christian and started going to church, I soon realized that premarital sex was wrong. This teaching was accepted as I read various New Testament passages warning against sexual immorality. But society's pressures, coupled with the fermenting desire, have made life difficult to say the least. I begin to ask if premarital sex could be tolerated as a lesser evil, meeting a basic human need. It's not right, but it is okay because of mitigating circumstances like remaining single into adulthood. Thinking this way created an incredible conflict of passions. Nevertheless, I have been a very sincere Christian since conversion and haven't had much of a sex life until now. My sex drive was not checked at the door when I entered a state of grace. After reading the enclosed article, he sent me the article given to me by a girlfriend who was also your student, though we did not know each other at Moody, my conscience has been liberated. The problem I have is understanding my liberty in light of the church's teaching. Every church I've attended has denounced premarital sex, including the conservative church I now attend. Somehow, at least for Christian churches I've been involved with, premarital sex has become a form of sexual immorality. My own research has persuaded me that sexual immorality has nothing to do with sincere sexual relationships with or without sexual intercourse between unmarried people. It is in no way a compromise of biblical morality to engage in premarital sex. Rather, sexual relations before marriage are normal and are to be enjoyed in good conscience before God. Do you understand what this man is saying? Sex between a, husband, a man and a woman unmarried is perfectly okay with God. In light of what I've written in this letter and as a favor to a former student who respects your judgment, please take a few, mo few moments to respond to the following questions. What I want to know is, is there any reason to avoid premarital sex? Lots of reasons. Secondly, how do I enjoy, how, how do I think about premarital sex? It is wrong. How do I enjoy premarital sex? You don't. How can you engage in sex knowing that the Bible speaks against it before marriage. So this topic is important 
for you and me, even if we are senior citizens. And why is that? For these reasons, the Bible often speaks openly about sex. If, it, if God does that, is it wrong for you and me to do that? If there's one place that sex can be spoken about correctly, it should be in a Christian church. Secondly, this is for our own courtship and marriage. Now, we all know that there are some senior citizens who never marry until they're in their senior years. And there are more who get remarried as a, as a senior citizen. So we need this information. Uh, should we be in that category for our own courtship and marriage or remarriage? And for our children and grandchildren. And now, number four, to help others outside our family. Senior citizens. I view senior citizens as a reservoir of experience, knowledge, wisdom that can be offered to young people around us. So the more you and I know what the Bible has to say about sex, the better prepared we are to help those that God brings across our path. Now, um, some years ago, our son Jeff graduated from college and moved to Wisconsin to start working in a job. And on a particular uh, Saturday, he called me and he said, Dad, I have some bad news for you. I've got a girlfriend. And I said, Jeff, I'm not against you having a girlfriend. Tell me about her. And so he starts telling me uh, about, uh, now, this is not her name. This is what I'm going to call her. He started telling me about uh, Penny. She's beautiful, well-educated, has a good job, ambitious, disciplined. And I sensed, as he was describing her in all these glowing terms, I sensed I heard a B-U-T on the way. So she's beautiful, well-educated, good job, ambitious, does one, but she's not a Christian. Jeff, I'm telling you, boy, you got the wrong girl. I'm telling you, Jeff, you got the wrong kind of girl. You're a Christian. The Bible says if you're a Christian, you must not be romantically involved with a non-Christian. I know, I know, Dad but I'm lonely up here in Wisconsin. I don't have any friends. She's a good moral girl. We have fun together. We're not doing anything wrong. Jeffrey, I'm telling you, son, you need to stay away from her. How long has it been since you've been to church? Four months. Four months. Now, this is Saturday. Tomorrow is Sunday, and I want you to go to church. Is that clear? Okay, Dad, I will. Well, the next day, when, I, when mine and Sue's uh, worship service over, she and I were driving home, and Jeff calls me on the phone. And he says, Dad, I did what you asked. I went to church. And I took my girlfriend with me, Penny. And as we, were, as we walked into the church, the ushers handed us a, a bulletin outlining the, the church service, just like we have here. And as she and I were going to our seats, I opened the bulletin to look and see what the pastor was going to preach on. And the title of his sermon was, Stay Away From Her. <laughs> And I asked, Jeffrey, have you heard that before? Yes, Dad, I heard that from you yesterday. And then, he said, and then he said this, what are the chances that title could have been a coincidence in light of that conversation that you and I had yesterday when you were telling me to keep my distance away from her? He said that could not have been a coincidence. And I asked him, what the, what the pastor preach on? And what do you think it was? Proverbs chapter 5, our passage for today. And he said, that passage was crystal clear. There was nothing ambiguous about it. And when the service was over, she and I walked to my car in the parking lot. We got in it, and I said, Penny, I can't do this anymore. I can't date you anymore. She said, oh, I'm not good enough. And he said, that's not the issue. The issue is, I'm a Christian and you're not. She said, you're right about that. I have no interest whatsoever in God or religion. I want nothing to do with that. So he broke up with her. And several times she, later, she tried to weasel her way back in the relationship, and he kept her out. So Proverbs 5 that we're going to look at, I want to sum up a whole passage um, in one uh, remark. And do I have that remark here? Mm. I don't. I don't know what happened to that. Okay, 
uh, we're going we're to get to the remark. Let me, let me just put it this way. Here, here's, I want to sum up Proverbs 5 like this. Sex is a wonderful gift to be enjoyed only with the right person at the right time. The right person is our divinely provided spouse, and the right time is only within marriage. And I don't think that I've got the breakdown here, but that's okay. Let's, let's take the handout that you've been given, and let's work our way quickly through this very important passage. Now, I want you to look at the first two words in verse 1. My sons. Anybody need the handout? If you need the handout, just raise your hand. First, the first two words in verse 1, my son. Now skip down to verse 7 and look at the third and fourth words, my sons. So I think what this is saying, there are occasions when dad and mom, and who is mainly responsible to teach, talk to our children about sex? Dad, mom, not the pastor. The pastor should supplement what dad and mom do. Uh, so I think that the singular in verse 1, he's talking to one child, and then the plural in verse 7, he's talking to more than one, I think suggests there are times when, when we ought to gather all our children together at once and talk to them about this subject, and then later there should be, there'll probably be occasions where we talk to them one by one individually according to their needs or their questions. Now, once you know that Sue and I started talking to our children about sex when they were little children. Now, fortunately, we don't, you don't need to talk, you don't need to say much to little children about sex, but you introduce them to the topic. And you tell them only as much as they need to know. Now, as they grow and get older, you tell them a little bit more and a little bit more. Now, to our children, dad and mom talking to them about this issue, it was like talking to them about other important issues. They were perfectly comfortable with it. Now, what I want to say here, Today, I have a 42-year-old son and 44-year-old son. They are still comfortable coming to dad and talking to me about this issue, bringing their questions, uh, bringing their, their uh, problems and temptations to me. Now, I want to say one last thing before we get into this passage. In this passage, listen carefully, the bad person is a female. And that's because... A dad is talking to his boys about this. Now, this is not implying that men are more moral than women. Actually, generally speaking, it's the other way around. Usually, women are more moral than men are. But again, to repeat myself, because a father is talking to his sons, the bad person is a female. Okay, so verse 1, the dad begins. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Now, in line 2, he's going to say the same thing just in different words. This is what scholars call synonymous parallelism. To impress an idea into a hearer's mind, successive lines repeat the same idea, just using different words to do it. So in basically in the first line, he's going to say to his son, pay attention to me. In the second line, he's going to say, listen carefully. So verse 1, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Second line, incline your ear. Listen very carefully to my understanding. Now, why should the boy listen to his dad? Verse 2, that, this means here's the reason, that you may observe my discretion. Now, what he's getting at is, if you listen to your dad's discretion, you will form sound judgment. This dad knows what's coming to his son. Temptation. Now, if you listen to your dad's, if you listen to your dad's uh, discretion, you will form good judgment that will enable you to rightly assess sexual temptation to see what it is really like. And look at the last line of verse 2. And that your lips may reply with knowledge. I want you to be prepared to give an appropriate response to the person who invites you to her bed. Now, verse 3 identifies the one. Now, I want to point out uh, in verse, in verse 3. It's going to identify the one to whom the son will have to give a reply. For the proposition, the lips of an adulteress, that is, the proposition that comes from her lips, drip honey, not literally, this is figurative, is enticingly sweet and smoother than oil, is her invitation. Now notice the book of Proverbs. This father has his eyes open to reality. What's he saying? Sexual temptation is very attractive. 
attractive and enticing. It promises lots of pleasure and delight and fun. Most of us don't think clearly in the heat of temptation. So now is the time for prudent people to make up their mind, make up their decision about what their response is going to be when tempted. Now, verse Verse 4 brings forth the reality. But the result of sinning with her is bitter as wormwood. Now, wormwood was ancient mothballs. It was extracted from a certain tree, and the Jews was terribly bitter, and the Hebrews put it on furniture and clothing, and it was so bitter, bugs stayed away from it. What's he saying here? The result of sexual immorality is going to be as bitter to our soul as that wormwood tastes to the, to the tongue, sharp as a two-edged sword. Take a double-edged sword, stick it through a man's stomach. It hurts. Well, there's going to be terrible pain, usually emotional pain, that comes from sexual immorality. Now, the consequences don't end with mere pain. Verse 5, her feet. Now, this is a hard verse. Her feet go down to death. I want you to know that we have an unusual figure of speech here called metalepsis. One metonymy is expressed, here it is, the feet are put for the woman's feet. And a second metonymy is implied in the one expressed. Here's the second metonymy. I'm going to put it in parentheses because it's only implied. So the feet are put for the, the adulteress, and the woman, the adulteress, is put for illicit sexual relationships with her. So let me read it that way. Illicit relations with her can end in an early grave. Now we're all going to die. But he's talking about premature death. Impure relations with her can lead to premature death. How so? Well, here, uh, here are a number of ways that sexual immorality can send a person to the grave ahead of schedule. Uh, Proverbs talks about this right here, the en enraged innocent spouse. Now, when I was a, stu uh, a seminary student at, in Dallas, uh, one day, a, a Dallas police officer came home early, caught his wife in bed with another man. On the spot, he pulled out his revolver and shot both of them dead. He was so incensed at his wife's betrayal by having sex with another man. Shot him dead. Um, civil courts. Civil courts can have people executed. Now, uh, I was overseas... And I was looking at a newspaper, and here was a picture taken against the law in that land by a foreigner. He was up in a hotel. He heard commotion outside. He looked outside, and on the sidewalk was uh, a man on his knees, and a crowd was around him. And the executioner with a sword had just cut his head off because the man was caught in adultery. And when the, when the picture was snapped, there was a geyser of about six feet of his blood uh, spewing up in a circle like that. So there are countries today in certain places of the world that will execute a person for sexual immorality. Uh, one of my students at Moody, um, her, her mother was from the Middle East. She came over here to Colorado to get a college education, and her mother got pregnant with an American student, not her husband, and she went back to that country, and when her family found out she was pregnant, they were going to kill her. She had to come back to America to escape her family. Um, disease can lead to death. Divine punishment and also suicide. I had a, I had a student, Moody, and she fell into immorality, and when she was dismissed from the institute, along with a fellow who was dismissed, she told me, I was so distraught. How could I have allowed this to happen? I never thought I would fall into this. She was so distraught, she thought seriously about ending her life. Now, verse 6 continues describing the adulterer. She does not ponder the right course of conduct leading to real life. She's not thinking about it. Her ways miss the path. She's headed toward a miserable life. Now, because... Immorality is so detrimental. The dad says in verse 7, Now then, my sons, listen to me and retain the instruction of my mouth. King Solomon, he, he wrote many of the Proverbs. He's viewed as the wisest man who ever lived. But he became the biggest fool who ever lived. It's not that 
Remember, he had a godly, wonderful wife called the Shulamite. And then he began to wonder if the grass was greener on the other side. And do you remember how many wives he ended up with? 300 and 400 concubines or mistresses. And where did he go wrong? It's not that he didn't know the truth. He quit listening to the truth and decided, I'll go out and see if the grass is greener on the other side. Retain the instruction of my mouth. Now the instruction proper begins in verse 8. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Avoid tempting situations. Um, some years ago, there was a pastor of a church in Chicago, a big church, and he had me preach for him quite often. He went on vacation out to California. And he's sitting in a restaurant. He takes out his cell phone. He calls a young woman who used to be in his church, but years earlier moved out to California. And he called her on the phone and said, Hey, this is Pastor so-and-so. I'm in your town. I'd like to get with you and just get an update on you. And I'm at this certain restaurant. Why don't you come and join me for lunch? She said, I'm just too tired. Instead, why don't you come to my apartment? Now, was that a good idea? Hmm. He went to her apartment. He said, I didn't go there with the intention of having sex. He did. And the news of that gradually made its way back to Chicago, and he was dismissed from his church. So what's the advice here? Verse 8, keep, uh, keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Avoid any tempted situation you get into, and if you avoid it, it lowers the risk of falling into this sin. Now verse 9 tells why you should stay away from her house. Lest, the word lest means to avoid something to prevent something from happening. Lest you give your vigor, your skill, your talents to others. In sex, a person gives himself to the other person and the prime years of your life to the cruel one. Now notice what Scripture is saying. The person with whom you have sexual immorality is going to turn out being cruel to you. That person doesn't mean to, but because of the trouble and the grief that person is going to help you into, He's going to turn out to be cruel. So the first reason to avoid sexual immorality is to avoid wasting the years of your life. Verse 9 is clarified in verse 10. Lest, here's something else you want to prevent, strangers possess your strength. What a strange statement. How can people possess your strength? This is a figure of speech which means lest people possess the wealth gained by your strength. And your labors, that is the hard-earned goods secured by your labors, go to an alien's house. So reason number two is financial. Now, how can sexual immorality end up costing a person? Well, a number of ways. Medical bills, uh, treating uh, STDs, legal fees. It can wreck your marriage, and you can end up being divorced. Support of an unwanted child, blackmail. Um, I hate to say this, but I had an aunt. Um... Not a good person. And she carried on an adulterous affair with a businessman in another state. And then he got tired of it. And he said, it's over with. And she said, oh, it's not over with at all. You'll pay me $1,000 a month or I go to your wife and I spill the beans about your affair behind her back. So he paid her thousands of dollars. And then after a while he said, I don't care. Go ahead and tell my wife. Well, his wife divorced him. And that cost him more money as well. Uh, or it, you, it costs to support a mistress. A third reason is given in verse 11 to avoid immorality. Unless you groan at your latter end of a short life when your body, when your flesh and body are eaten up with disease. So reason number three is medical. Um, and of course the big scare today is AIDS. AIDS can be contracted through immorality. Now Sue had a, a, a friend whose son was 32 years old. He was, he was very immoral. He was warned about AIDS. And he said, chances are slim that I can get AIDS through this. And what do you suppose he came down with? AIDS. A fourth reason is given in verse 12. And you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised reproof. So the fourth reason is remorse. Verse 13. And I have not listened to the instruction of my teachers, nor did I heed my instructors. Now, I want you to look at this remark. 
uh, th uh, this statement comes from one of my former students. He came from a poor third world country in Africa to Moody to prepare to be an evangelist. And then after Moody, he wanted to uh, go to graduate school in Chicago and get a job so he could pay for graduate school and send money back to Africa to his poor widowed mother with seven younger children. And he made this statement. Here's the way he said it. God's word is so true. Now, you might think that was because God blessed him with something. It was just the opposite. There was a woman who had nothing to do with Moody who lived a few blocks down from the institute, and she was, uh, she was obsessed with this Moody student trying to constantly say, I I'd like to date you. I want you uh, as my boyfriend. He said, no, I'm just a friend. I have no romantic interest in you. And then he said one night, late at night, I was getting ready to go to bed in my dormitory on campus, and she called me on the phone. And she said, I've just taken a delicious apple pie out of the oven. Why don't you come down uh, to my apartment and enjoy a slice with some hot tea? And he said, I knew I shouldn't have gone, but I did. I didn't go down there with the intention to have sex. We did, and she got pregnant. And then she said, okay, now that I'm carrying your baby, you need to marry me. And he said, I'm not going to do it. I made a mistake having sex with you. I'm not going to make another mistake and marry you. And so she went back to New England to her family to raise a child. But now he's, he's on the hook for 18 years to help her financially provide for that unwanted child. And that's why he said it. God's word is so true. And I asked him, what do you mean by that? And he said, God warned me in Scripture about sexual immorality if I had just listened to him and heeded those warnings, I wouldn't be in the dilemma that I'm in. God's word is so true. Okay, he learned the hard way. Can't you and I learn the right way? Verse, verse 14, here's the fifth reason. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. So reason five is to avoid social shame, uh, social shame and ruin. Now, up to this point, up to this point, this passage has largely been negative. Abstain from sex with the wrong person. Are we always to abstain? No. Now, in verses 15 through 20, the passage suddenly turns positive. It's basically going to say, enjoy sex with your spouse. So what's the solution to sexual immorality and temptation? Here it is in verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern. What's the solution to sexual immorality? Drink a lot of water. Well, we can't take that literally. That's like when I was a teenager, they would say, now when you're tempted with uh, sexual temptations, take a cold what? Shower. And I did. Didn't help a bit. And so we have a figure of speech here. Um, the, I want to uh, turn your attention to the last word in the first line of verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern. This is a fear of speech called hypocatastasis. One thing is not said to be, but only implied to be something else. The cistern or the well is one's spouse. And drink water. Now, uh, when I take a swig of this water, if I drink it, what am I doing? I am partaking of some of the water. So when he says partake of water, what he means here is drink water, partake of sex, partake of sex with your spouse. So let's look at verse 15 in that light. Partake of the sexual charms from your wife and fresh water, physical allurements from your own well. As a cold drink of water on a hot day quenches a man's thirst, so his sexual need is satisfied by physical intimacy with his wife. Now verse 15 is confirmed by verse 16. Should your springs, what springs? Let's go back to verse 15, water. Should your springs of water, now he's speaking figuratively, the erotic delights enjoyed, be obtained from abroad, that is, from other females who are outside your home? Uh, this is eroticist. Uh, he's, the, the son is saying, should you have sex with women outside your home that you're not married to? But this is the asking of a rhetorical question, not to obtain an answer, but to emphatic state a point. So should you, uh, should you have sex with women outside your home? No, indeed, is what he's saying. Last two lines of 16. Should streams of water 
physical enticements were taken up come from the streets, that is, women on the streets, others who are not your wife? No. 16's question is answered in 17. Let them. Now, the word them goes back to streams of water. Physical enticements from your, from your spouse. Let sexual charms be yours alone, belong to you by way of your wife, and not for strangers with you. Don't share your wife with other men. How many of you are familiar with, um, I don't mean by experience, but you've heard of wife swapping clubs in America? Let me see your hand. If at least you've heard of them, of course you have. They're big deals. And uh, don't be offended when I tell you this, but how do wife swap, swapping clubs work? Well, let, let's put it this way. Uh, my wife and I are bored with our sexual relationship. It's so stale. So let's do this. This weekend, you take my wife, enjoy sex with her. I'll take your wife, enjoy sex with her. When the weekend's over, we, we give our wives back to each other, our proper wives back to each other. And maybe that weekend will add a spark, jumpstart uh, our stale sex life. Now, um, if, you've not, if you've not ever been invited to join one of those, that's a bit surprising because they're so popular. Now, I read a book written by a secular organization in San Francisco that studied wife swapping clubs. They never mentioned God. They never mentioned the Bible. They never mentioned morals, purely secular organization. They study wife swapping clubs, and here's what they found out, the bottom line. They said every wife swapping couple that we studied who exchanged spouses and had sex with them, Every example we studied, those marriages were ruined. Ruined every single one of them. That's what immorality leads to. Verse 18 repeats 17's truth of the added idea of enjoyment. Let your fountain... Now, the wife is still viewed as the source of uh, sexual satisfaction. Let your fountain, your wife who is the sole source of sexual fulfillment, be praised because she satisfies your sexual needs and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now listen to what one commentator wrote. A person is praised when he or she provides for one's spouse's sexual needs and when that person is the delight of his spouse in accord with the laws of God in marriage, which is in contrast to illicit lust. Now, my commanding officer in the Marine Corps said this to me one time. Sex is good as long as it doesn't come from the same woman all the time. Was he right about that? Look at, look at verse 19. As a lovely deer and a graceful doe. Oh, she's beautiful. She delights me. Let her breast satisfy you at some of the time. Most of the time. No, all the times. Be exhilarated with her love. So God wired you and me up with sexual desires and passions. Those come from our holy creator. Those passions are good and proper. It's just that they are to be satisfied only through one person, the spouse that God provides for you and me. <clears throat> Those sexual desires that we have, they come from our creator. He's got good purposes for those. And one is, of course, procreation, to, to reproduce, to have children. Another is for marital pleasure. And I like the third reason for our sexual passions. Here's what they are. When a husband and wife engage in sexual relations, here's what happens. It just bonds them. Now listen carefully, not just physically, it goes way beyond that into their souls. I remember thinking, I'm enjoying sex with just one person in the world, my wife. Oh, that just deepens our relationship. God had a good idea of using sexual relations to emotionally bond a husband and wife together. Now, since your spouse can meet all your needs, verse 20, why should you? See, another eroticism, another insincere question. Why should you? 
my son, be exhilarated with, a, with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner. We must not know another person in this manner. Think about it. Sex with your spouse is one thing that makes your relationship with your spouse so unique and different from all the other friendships you have. Now, as a married person, have wonderful friendships with both uh, members of the, of the opposite sex. But we only enjoy sex, have sex with one person, our spouse. And again, that makes our relationship with our spouse so different than our relationship, good relationships with other people. So why should we abstain from sex, from premarital or extramarital sex? Verse 21, for the conduct of a person is before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his actions. Now, one reason I don't have an affair, and by the way, I'm going to talk to you all later at some point about the temptations that come to us outside of marriage. I've had my share. And uh, <clears throat> one reason I refuse to do that is because I could hide an adulterous affair from my wife, from my students, from you. Problem is... I can't hide it from the one person I need to be more concerned about, God. And when God sees what's going on, I want, to, I want us to remember he doesn't, his response is not like this. Oh, I see that and I don't like it, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Verse 22, his own iniquities will capture and trap the wicked, and he will be held by the power of his sin. Now, sexual immorality has been described, now watch me, Sexual immorality has been described by a man who falls off a skyscraper. And all the way down, he's saying, so far, so good. So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay, when a man falls off a skyscraper, there's no immediate result. But eventually, he's going to splatter like an egg on the pavement. So now, if I have an, an, an affair behind my wife's back, I might be saying, so far, so good. Oh, me and my mistress, we're enjoying this. Nobody knows. Nobody's being hurt. So far, so good. But I'm going to splatter, so to speak, like an egg on the pavement. 23, he may die prematurely for not a lack of instruction, disregarding instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, <clears throat> he will go astray. <clears throat> now, I want you to look at this verse. <clears throat> Don't fool yourselves. Now, that statement, don't fool yourselves, is really important because I've learned this. When, in my years of ministry, when a person wants to do wrong, he has no trouble justifying the wrong. So that in his eyes, he's not really doing wrong. He's doing what's okay. Just like that letter from the student from Boston that I read you. Don't fool yourselves. God is not mocked. That word mocked in Greek means outfoxed, outsmarted. We can't outsmart God. Whatever a person sows, whatever seeds a farmer plants in the ground, that he also reaps. So there is a law in agriculture that if you plant corn, you grow corn. If you plant tomatoes, you grow tomatoes. You don't plant cucumbers and grow watermelon. Now what's he getting at? If we, we, if we do good, blessing will come from it. If we do bad, difficulty will come from it. Proverbs 6.32, he who commits immorality lacks sense. How so? Well, he may think, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. There's no God. Wrong. God exists, but he doesn't care. Wrong. God cares, but he won't punish me. Wrong. God will punish me, but the pleasure is with it. It's worth it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So he who commits immorality lacks sense. Now listen, look at this. He who does it destroys himself. Do you want to destroy yourself? Surely not. Now, if there's only one word that I can use for sex, here's my choice. Sacred. What does that mean? It is so special. We enter into it and enjoy it with just one person, and that is our spouse. So here is, I want to sum up. This is the, the slide I was looking for at the beginning of the sermon. I want to sum up 
Proverbs 5 in this one statement. Sex is a wonderful gift to be enjoyed only with the right person at the right time. The right person is our divinely provided spouse, and the right time is only within the boundaries, the safeguards of marriage. Now, by way of practical application, several things. Let's resolve to grow individually in sexual purity. We must be doing this as long as we live. That is for us senior citizens as much as it is teenagers. We want to grow in sexual purity. Secondly, be careful to maintain healthy relationships with the opposite gender. Enjoy friendships, fellas, with women. Women, enjoy friendships with men. Let's just be careful to maintain appropriate friendships with them. Number three, in dating and engagement, establish and maintain appropriate boundaries from the outset. Fourthly, in romance, we should be helping one another to become a better person, and we should be pleasing God. Uh, years ago, there was a girl who came from, to Moody from Tennessee, going to the mission field. She'd never been touched, never been kissed by a man. She got into a relationship with a fellow at Moody from California, and they were eventually engaged, and then later he broke up the engagement. Now, I had nothing to do with their relationship, but when he broke up the engagement, she came to my office and said, uh, I want you to know that my boyfriend and I did everything sexually except intercourse. And so I went to him, and I said, is your ex fiance closer or further away from God because of you? And he said, further away. Is she more... Is she more virtuous or less so because of you? Less so. Better person or worse person because of your input? And he said, worse person. And I asked him, why didn't you help her to, come up, to become a better person? He said, I didn't think about it. So I urge the young men at Moody, when you have a girlfriend, think about it now. One of your responsibilities is to help strengthen her morals, help bring her closer to God, not further away. Help her to become a better person. And the young ladies need to do the same thing. I tell young women, you're going, when it comes to a man, you're going to be one of two things to a man in your life. A stepping stone or stumbling stone. Stepping stone, he gets, you help him get closer to God, become a man of God. Stumbling stone, oh, you can trip him up like with sex. And he, he detours and he becomes a worse person. So in romance, we should be helping one another become a better person. And we should be pleasing God. Fifthly, let's be available to help others struggling in this area of life and to offer good counsel to young people. And young people struggle immensely uh, with this. And, and lastly, uh, okay, uh, maybe we messed up in our past life. Is God going to frown at us and be disgusted with us the rest of our life? I really like what Jesus said in John 8 to that woman caught in adultery. Your sins are forgiven. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Now, when he says sin no more, he doesn't mean I expect you to be perfect. Nobody's capable of doing that. He means don't sin again in this particular area of life. So the Bible is full of hope for you and me. The ground at the foot of the cross is absolutely level. We all are sinners, needy sinners, standing on level ground. We all messed up, maybe in different areas of life. But with God, there is forgiveness. He wipes the slate clean. He gives us a new sexual purity, which we are to guard and develop and cultivate and mature until married when we can, with a clear conscience, engage in sex with our spouse. So, Father, we thank you for your word, which is a light to our path. It's like a bright light shining in a dark, sinful world. And we dads and moms are concerned about our children because we're made in your image. You're concerned for us. We thank you for your word. I pray that like that dad urged his son, listen carefully to my instructions, that we listen carefully to you and let your words come into our heart and guide us in this very important area of life. In Jesus' name, amen.